I know that I did everything in my power as an individual, as a scientist, as a learned person, to find a logical explanation for what I witnessed and photographed. I have yet to find it. If anything, it has opened up a whole new world to me that I never knew existed. It's time we get this out in the open. Address it, accept it, and study it. When there's a documentary that shows that there's a whole bunch of us that have managed to suspend our disbelief long enough to listen to each other and to inquire and to share that it really brings the sharing closer and more people will come forward and share and pretty soon it'll be a groundswell. The whole purpose is to educate people, educate young people because they'll, they'll come a time where they're gonna have to deal with this and it shouldn't be through fear. I'm excited that children might have the chance to really examine data themselves, to not be convinced by the opinions of people before them positively or negatively, but to really have data that they can start making their own decision. We have to learn it at all generational levels and ch bringing the children up uh, to understand these phenomena is vital. It's important that children think, know more about UFOs so they know more about other living beings. If I saw a spaceship hovering over, I would, I would be ecstatic. It's important for people to keep their hearts open for people from other planets. <laughs> I wouldn't know what to think. I'm not, I was definitely being visited by other intelligent life. I wouldn't believe it. I would probably feel like really cool, like honored that like other life forms were visiting me of all people. That would be proof that there was some other life form. They aren't the same as us, but nobody's the same as anybody. I would freak. I would just freak out. I guess excitement, you know, what, what, what's, what's this gonna mean? I wouldn't know how they would want to approach me. I would probably be startled and surprised. Or if they would be friendly. I would work very hard to figure out how to make first contact. Or if we could understand each other right off. I would try to be as non-threatening as possible. I would be a little frightened. And try to find out what's going on. In 1995, both my husband and I witnessed three amber orbs in a triangle formation, one on top and two closely aligned underneath, very close to our home, about 100 yards from our home, hovering above a private desert area. It was startling and it was amazing. 
at the same time. There was nothing there but blackness and these three amber orbs. And something told me to take everything in, the size, the shape, the color, the distance. They were about three to six feet each, depending on how close or far away they were. They were definitely oval shaped. And the amber color within each orb, and I call them an orb because the light did not extend outside the edge at all. It was totally self-contained. It was very uniform, amber color, and it didn't glare at all. Every other light out there glares. And we have a, a beautiful panoramic view of the city skyline, so we know what helicopters and plane lights and street lights and so forth, every light out there glares. These did not. Very soothing, very mesmerizing. And I thought, if I don't get a picture of this, nobody's gonna believe it. And as I ran to the closet to get my camera, my husband calls me back, he says, get over here quick, one of them is disappearing. And as I rushed back, we both watched in awe as the top orb started to dim as if on a dimmer switch, it didn't budge at all. It didn't waver, it didn't take off, it just dimmed as if it was on a dimmer switch, as if once it disappeared, it was still there, but we didn't see it anymore. I got onto the balcony, shot a quick picture of the two bottom orbs, and immediately noticed an eerie silence, as, as if time had stopped. Um, it was quite extraordinary, and as I'm staring at these two bottom orbs, I have to admit, it seemed that there was intelligent presence staring back. The thoughts going through my mind were, who are you, what are you, do you know that I'm here, I'd love to meet you. And the next thing I remember, the left bottom orb started to disappear and I quickly shot a picture of that. And that was the only picture that turned out at the time, but for me, it was quite amazing because it verified that something did happen. I caught a picture of it, amazingly, as one was disappearing and one was still there. I put it on my mantle and kind of watched it for a little bit and uh, wondered if I'd ever find out what this was. Eventually put the picture away, but I have to tell you that even though the picture was out of sight, the thought and the memory wasn't out of my mind. Did not see anything for two years. Two years passed and not a hint of anything, e even remotely close to these amber orbs. January 22nd, 1997, I noticed three amber orbs now at a distance far west on the horizon. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, even though they're in a line formation, they were amber, they were in a formation, they were hovering for minutes, strangely similar to the 95 incident. The next night, the three amber orbs are now in front of South Mountain. And I knew they were in front of South Mountain because there's red blinking warning lights for the airplanes that are coming into Sky Harbor just in front of South Mountain. And this was definitely lower and in front of South Mountain. And I thought, enough, I'm getting my video camera. I ran downstairs, I grabbed my video camera, I got out to the pool area. I took about 18 seconds worth, the battery went dead. I walk inside, hook up the battery, run outside, they're gone. Now this was about eight o'clock. About a half hour later, my husband comes up the drive and I gingerly walk outside and I said, honey, remember I told you about the amber orbs far west last night. Well, about a half hour ago, they were right in front of South Mountain. As I'm pointing like this, they reappear in the same spot. And I thought, I have to get a picture of this. And I ran upstairs, I grabbed my 35 millimeter, get out onto the balcony. As I'm ready to shoot the three bottom orbs, suddenly six amber orbs in a row, totally equidistant from each other, massive span across, pop up above the three and I started clicking away. I happened to get six pictures in a row. As the three bottom oars were disappearing, I caught this top formation, which, by the way, in retrospect, was in the same location and the same formation as two months later, on March 13th, 1997, during the mass sighting. And I ran in to call the, uh, the Arizona Republic because I wanted to get somebody out there to tell me what it was. And I get an apparator on the phone and I said, quick, you, you got to get somebody out there. There's some, there's some strange lights in front of South Mountain. Please get somebody out there, take a picture of it, whatever, but tell me what it is. As I finish my sentence, they're gone. By the next morning, I, I figured there must be a logical explanation. And I called the Arizona City Desk again and, and asked if anybody had called the night before to report strange lights in front of South Mountain. The operator got off. She got right back on. She said, nope, nobody called. Well, I know I called. So I said, well, we did see something that was strange. Um, who can I call to find out what they might be? And she said, well, Luke Air Force Base 
sometimes sends out experimental maneuvers and they don't tell the public about them. Um, and I thought, oh, that might be a, a good lead. And I, I call Luke Air Force Base. I get a woman well, lieutenant yes, on the I'm, phone. I'm, uh, and tried to be very professional. I said, my husband and I are, are both physicians. We live mountainside in Paradise Valley. And we saw some strange lights in front of South Mountain last night. Do you know what they might have been? And from the get-go, she had an attitude. And she said, well, they didn't come into Luke Air Force Base, and they didn't come out from here, so we had nothing to do with them. I said, well, be that as it may, we did see them. We both saw them, and I did get some on video. Somebody has to know what they were. They were, they were really, really strange. She said, well, you mentioned it was in front of South Mountain. Maybe somebody saw something at the airport, which is in front of South Mountain. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. So now it was a mission. I had to find out what this was. I got the FAA on the phone. I, I told him uh, the same thing. And he said, actually, there were three at 8 o'clock. They looked on radar. They didn't show up on radar. The three disappeared. At 8.30, the six popped up. The air traffic controllers at Sky Harbor Airport saw it, saw the same lights, but did not see them on radar. And they've seen flares before. In fact, from their vantage point at the tower, they wouldn't be able to see over the angle of the mountains and see over into the Barry Goldwater Range. After he picked up binoculars to look, it was that unusual. They were six points of light that seemed to be attached to something, but they couldn't see what it was attached to slowly moving in synchrony, as he put it, in tandem behind South Mountain. So I said, well, where were they? And there was silence. And finally he says, beats me. Major sighting here. On the 13th of March, weird happenings in the skies of a Phoenix person. And no one seems to be able to explain what it was. Suddenly, six amber orbs in a row, totally equidistant from each other. There are another 10,000 Arizonans who saw the Many same thing. Many investigators call it the, the largest sighting ever. The availability of witnesses was extraordinary. The data speaks for itself. Plus, I have photographs that cannot be explained or denied. But thousands of people saw more than stars in the night sky. The mystery remains unsolved and controversial. Last night, shortly after 8 p.m., hundreds, maybe thousands of Arizonans reported seeing a triangular-shaped object with three distinct lights. People say they saw strange lights all over the state. There was nothing there but blackness and these three amber orbs. The people who saw the lights will say the lights were orange, they were bright, and they were big, and they were like nothing they've ever seen before. And there's been no official explanation. This didn't look like anything I'd ever seen in right, my life. Eyewitnesses who saw it say it's like nothing they've ever seen before. On March 13th of 1997, I had left law enforcement, uh, and I pursued uh, uh, private investigations work. And uh, I was happened to be at 27th Avenue Van Buren doing some paperwork. I just would look up every now and then, and I was remember I was writing the writing my report, and I just looked up and something kind of caught my eye. It seemed just to kind of be floating and just you know just a constant speed, but you know I could nothing that I could associate with. I went outside, it must have been around 10-ish, and I'm looking off towards the north and kind of coming in directly at me are these three enormous lights and they are moving incredibly slow. And this really piqued my curiosity. That evening, the um, hospice volunteers and I were out on the patio discussing our patients and discussing the work that we were doing with hospice. And we were so engaged in conversation and looking at each other in the eye that all of a sudden, when somebody in our group said, oh my gosh, what is that up above? We all looked up at the same time and saw this amazing, huge, dark, silent object that appeared to just be right over our heads. It was awesome. I mean, we were telling ourselves not to blink. It was uh, very close to the ground. It was just like floating over the housetops. Pilots tell me when they make the left turn to go towards the Salt River to the north that the altitude is less than 3,000 feet. The object I saw and my wife saw went under this plane. The first thing that struck me is that they were just in a V-shaped formation. Well, it's at night and guys wouldn't have been flying in a V-shaped formation, in a VIC, we'd call it a VIC. 
So they, they would be in a VIC, and then all of a sudden I realized, wow, I don't see any navigation lights or anti-collision lights. So now I'm looking at five lights passing overhead silently at a very slow rate. And it also occurred to me that they were flying too slow to stay in the air if it was an aircraft. Many of the witnesses to the March 13th event described a V formation of five lights with two lights trailing. In fact, there were a couple of witnesses that described the two lights docking and undocking onto the array of five lights. Now, here we have in Dr. Kitai's photographs, a full two months before the Phoenix sighting, we have five lights in a V formation and two trailing lights. So obviously, this object was around for a long time before then, just something made it decide that it was going to fly over the entire state on the night of March 13th. We could not see the whole object from front to back, from side to side. It was so big. I would gauge this object to be <sighs> several football fields. I, I mean, like a mile, maybe more than a mile, maybe even two miles. It was huge. And it just kept going over our heads and going and going and going. And it seemed like we could actually just reach up and touch it. It was so low. I like to use the, the old peace sign, you know, stretch it out. But it was something like this. And as it passed, all we could really see was the left wing of the craft as it passed in front of us. That was how low it was as it passed. And as it started to pass in front of us, I put my hand up to where the nose of the craft was, and I took my other arm out to where the end of the wing was, and it was well over 30 inches. And I said to my wife at the time, I said, that's a mile long. The lights did not move relative to each other. Had they been in a formation of separate aircraft, there would have been a slight relative movement I would have perceived, and they stayed pretty much just locked in position. So I'm pretty sure it was a single aircraft, wider than any other aircraft flying today. It was quite obvious to me this was not a conventional aircraft. As the craft flew overhead, the lights resembled can lights, like you see in the ceiling, so fairly defined as circles in this V-shaped formation, but no harsh glare to them. What struck me was the sheer size of these lights. It was an orangish amber light, and it was so rich and lustrous, it's almost as if the objects seemed to be made, comprised of the light itself, which is strange. But imagine if you could, that light would have material property, the physical property, it was almost as if the orb was crafted out of light. They are absolutely perfect in every aspect of, of you know, every geometrical aspect that could be observed. They uh, were perfectly, uniformly round. They were perfectly, uniformly equidistant. Video doesn't do it justice. In real life, they're huge. They're amber. There's no flaring. They're like a ball. Uh, on the video, they flicker, they're white, uh, they're much smaller. But nonetheless, the formations themselves are, are compelling. When it got directly over my head, and I mean, I'm talking dead center here, I was right underneath this thing. And I look up, it was like there was no filament in this thing. They appear to be in a canister. There was light swimming around in this shape or form. They didn't glare, there was, they did not emit a, like a beam, like a floodlight, like landing light craft land. There seemed to be some depth to them. I noticed it was a triangle shaped, with three huge lights, and they weren't beaming down like landing lights, they were just big balls of light, but very pretty. They blocked out stars as they moved. You could not see objects beyond them as they would pass in front of them. In between these lights, though, it did seem somewhat denser. It seemed darker, like there was a shape or form going on there that was holding these things together. It was like looking through water. And if you've ever seen that little wavy motion and so forth, that's what that's like. What absolutely struck me as being eerie beyond belief, the immense size of this thing would have to be controlled by something that had a pretty strong engine just to sustain flight. There was not a buzz, there was not a hum, 
There was not a jet engine. There was not a prop engine. There was not a jet prop engine. There was absolutely no sound at all. Just three beautiful lights coming towards us. And uh, it just, it seemed to move effortlessly. It just glided right over. This was one solid object, one craft, one big, large boomerang. Everybody that called me said the same thing. It was huge, it was slow, it was low, it was totally silent. They could see some lights somewhere between five and nine lights on it at any given time. The lights were not like spotlights. They were more like glowing, uh, gaseous globes. What struck me immediately about the Phoenix Lights incident was the sheer number of witnesses. Uh, the availability of the witnesses. Was, this was peak time for the comet hale bob that seemed to come out of nowhere a few, a few months earlier. It brought thousands of people out of their homes in the early evening to see what the comet would look like as it got closer and closer. And when you think about thousands of people living along the most populated corridor of Arizona, outside on a very clear, quiet night, looking up purposely in the sky for a glimpse of the Hale-Bopp Comet. When the phenomena pass right over their heads, 30 miles an hour, some people did see it take off at a tremendous speed. I think they went out of their way to let us know that they're here. That was a parade that came right through, right through Sky Harbor airspace, protected airspace, right through downtown Phoenix. When we first started getting the calls, it was more in the north area of Phoenix, and as the calls progressed, it was traveling Central Phoenix and South Phoenix, everyone said, described it the same way. It was um, five lights or seven lights, V or wedge shaped. It was low, they said very low, it was huge. People said it was mile wide. Some people saw the lights attached to uh, the V shaped craft, but most of them did not see the craft, they just saw the lights in the V shape. The one call that stands out most is a lady that lived on the base of South Mountain and she said it flew literally over her head. She could see the craft. And I remember her saying it was silent, couldn't even hear a hum. And it just, that one really, I, could, I really pictured the craft from her description. The objects that were witnessed were clearly, uh, they were intending to be seen in terms of appearing over mass, uh, the concentration of population of the whole state. Uh, coming down I-17, uh, virtually uh, from stem to stern. We're talking the entire state of Arizona from as early as 5.30 p.m. all the way to as late as 2 o'clock in the morning. It was not one event or two events, but it was many events. 10,000 people approximately witnessed this, one of the largest uh, experiences of this sort ever recorded. The Phoenix Lights phenomenon didn't seem to be falsifiable in any way. It was being validated by most everybody that saw it. We had hundreds of calls. No, they were all saying the same thing. You could tell they weren't on drugs or drunk. They weren't kooks. They were legitimate people calling. We just couldn't believe it. Nothing like this has ever happened. I worked there 24 years. Never, ever had calls like this, ever. We found quickly that uh, there was a complete cross-section in the Phoenix Lights witnesses of our society, from truck drivers to attorneys, to doctors, lawyers, uh, aerospace people, military. Air traffic controllers on duty who could see the lights but not see them on radar. We all were swamped with the light, the strange lights in the sky calls. There were about 15 of us and they all said about the same. We, we just said the same thing. We didn't know what to say. I mean, it never happened before. And you know, we aren't trained in, in, in asking UFO questions. So we just, we just tried to reassure them that, you know, we're doing what we can, which the officers are aware of it. I said, all right, the police helicopters are up. So we're doing what we can do. Just from what? you read in the, the press accounts, I think they profoundly affected a lot of people. If you could have heard their voices, they just were astounded. When they saw those lights, they knew it wasn't something of this earth. It wasn't flares, it wasn't a helicopter, it wasn't anything they'd ever seen before. It was totally not of this earth. My emotion was that of uh, just kind of wonderment and trying to figure out what am I looking at? What am I seeing here? I wasn't frightened, I was just uh, in awe of it because it was so abnormal. I don't remember anyone being frightened. They were just amazed and excited and like, unbelievable, what's going on? 
just they just wanted to know what is going on you know what is that do you know there you know usually when you call the police you get answers and we didn't have answers for them because we didn't know either none of us was apprehensive about what we were seeing this was the very interesting part looking back on it and I especially was very very intrigued and excited with the idea that this is something miraculous that's happening right now this was a planned event it was not accidental it was very well orchestrated to say the least, even an elegant production, if you will. I was looking at the newspaper to see if there was any information on the strange lights in the sky. I found a very small article where it quoted a Phoenix police spokesperson who said the 911 center only got a few calls on the matter. And I thought, this is ridiculous. So that night when I went into work, I talked to my supervisor and I asked her, you know, what gives? You know that's not true. She said, I know, but I, I have no idea, you know, why they said that. And I was just thinking to myself, oh, the cover-up begins already. After I heard all of this over the next couple of months, I thought something really strange has happened, and I want to know what it is. It was Jim Delatosa that suggested to a producer that was in interviewing us for the Phoenix Lights that... Uh, if uh, they wanted to try to get a public official to make a statement, they should just go down to City Hall and see if they could corner someone. Well, they happened to catch Frances Barwood when she was on her way into a city council meeting. As I was going into the meeting, I was stopped by a reporter, uh, and she had with her a TV cameraman and a microphone man. And uh, they started asking me about these lights that went over Phoenix. And I thought something had just happened, and I said, when did this happen? And she said, well, it was actually March 13th. And she said, we asked the city what it was, if they could find out, and the answer from the mayor's office was, we don't have UFOs over Phoenix. And I thought that was a pretty strange thing, being that nobody had said it was a UFO, they just wanted to find out what it was. So I went into the meeting, and came my turn, and I said there were these reporters, a reporter outside, and had asked some questions about these lights that went over Phoenix last March 13th, and could we find out what it was? And she thought it was a fair question, was asked of her, and she wanted to know herself, and she asked the question in chambers and uh, got quite a, uh, an interesting reaction. Everybody just kind of turned around and looked at me like, why did you ask that? And it was like this silence. <laughs> and, I, and I felt kind of uneasy. And then somebody, one of the other council members, made some kind of a joke. And they went on. They didn't assign me two staff members. They didn't say who was going to look into it. They didn't say who was going to get back to me. And I thought, that was really unusual. After the meeting was over, one of the assistant uh, city managers came up to me. and and said, you shouldn't have asked that question. And this is the first I heard about it. I mean, nothing else was ever discussed with me at any, any point. And I said, why? And he said, well, because it's something that they don't want to deal with. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, the mayor's office didn't want to have to make any kind of a statement. They already issued a statement, and, and they just didn't want to have to go into it. And I thought this was, you know, so unusual. Something flies over our airspace, flies over our airport's airspace, is seen by pilots and, and flight crew and um, tower crew and everything, and they are afraid for me to bring up this question. You know, when this all started, the, the reason that I asked the question about this um, incident that happened on, on March 13th, 1997, which has come to be known as the Phoenix Lights, was because I thought, you know, this is a public safety issue, and we need to know whatever it was in case it comes back, in case, you know, it happens again, or in case uh, there's a danger to the people or buildings or whatever because we have antennas that are high. And I couldn't understand the negative reaction that I got for asking this when I thought that was, a, to me, a perfectly innocent question. Well, as she was pilloried in the press and made fun of, uh, the positive effect, however, was that hundreds of people came out of the woodwork and made phone calls to her office and her home. My answer machine at work totally filled up. Since they couldn't get any more calls into my office, they started calling other council members' office, leaving messages for me. 
They called the mayor's office, leaving messages for me. Uh, we estimate we got several thousand phone calls. We decided to call back every single one of them. Over the next couple of months, I personally talked to over 700 people. Everybody but one, <laughs> everybody but one told the exact same story. And the one was the one that they publicized, which was a kid who said he saw they were airplanes. Well, you know, when you have like 700 to one saying this was not airplanes, I had active military, retired military, police officers, firemen, um, Little League coaches that were out that night with the whole Little League saw it, the parents saw it, people jogging, people shopping. That was really an important uh, single event in opening up the case for us was Frances Barwood, and I give her a lot of credit for her courage, especially uh, holding forth and holding up through all the criticism that she got. I believe she was very courageous, and um, it's, it's, it's gonna take more people like her and like uh, Dr. Lin, the author of The Phoenix Lights, coming out and lending credibility, lending their name to a phenomenon that I believe is very real and needs to be studied. Wrote a letter to Senator McCain. Senator McCain sent his letter to the National Archives. In his letter, he didn't say I was a councilwoman. He said he had a citizen who wanted to know what happened on March 13th, 1997, and um, the letter, the tone, of, the whole tone of the letter was like kind of sarcastic. And I found out that when you send something to the National Archives, they don't answer, they file it. The ultimate, um, shall we say, um, insult was the governor of the state of Arizona, Fife Symington, finally calling a news conference saying that he has finally got the answer to the Phoenix Lights and he introduces some staff member dressed up as a space alien, give me a break. If we continue to treat this particular issue that way, we are doing a disservice to our children generations and generations down the road. Right after his press conference, I started getting so many phone calls. People saying, I can't believe what he did. And, you know, this is serious. And it was very upsetting to a lot of people and uh, people got very angry because here is the top elected official of the state making fun of what I estimate to be close to probably 10,000 people saw this. Pay attention to what went on here. Pay attention in particular to the witnesses, the citizens, because the government's not gonna provide the answers. Don't lean on the government, don't point the finger, don't go to court, don't waste your time because they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're trying to preserve the national security. That's their job. It's important that they maintain secrets for our defense because there's a lot of uh, strife in the world still, a lot of crazy people were, of course, in the age of terrorism. So let's not point the fingers at the government. Let's open our arms and our minds and our hearts to the citizens who have extraordinary tales to tell. When they came out a few, several months later, five months later, with the, the flare explanation, I immediately knew that that's not what we saw. That was just ridiculous. Flares go down. They don't float across the sky. Being in the military, I've launched those flares, and they were not flares. Uh, those flares fall, you know, up and down. They don't fall. Even in the wind, they don't maintain that altitude. Not one of my callers ever said that they were in a downward motion or flickering out. They were all, all the callers, they were traveling. Most of them just saw the lights, five to seven lights. Some of the callers did see the actual V or wedge-shaped craft, and it was a craft, it was not flares. This is off of the video from Dr. Kitai, and we have the triangle formation again. You know, airplanes dropping flares would have a difficult time getting a perfect triangle time after time. The flares that the military claimed they dropped on the night of March 13th would be an illumination flare, which would provide light for people on the ground to see what the enemy might be doing. They do work with flare on a daily basis. They weren't flares. I knew they weren't conventional aircraft. Um, flares emit smoke, uh, and the illumination from the flare would illuminate the smoke as well, so you would have a trail from the flare leading up. 
These lights up here represent aircraft flares. If you'll notice, they are not in any straight line. They vary in distance between each other. And if you look at the top, you can see the smoke. As the flare falls, it leaves a trail of smoke above it from the burning magnesium in the flare. Flares are moving relative to each other. They're moving at different speeds. The Phoenix lights are rock steady. When you're looking at these points of light, if you were trying to decide are they part of a large vehicle or are they aircraft flares, what you would look at is the position. In this case, these points of light stay identical in relationship to each other. If they were aircraft flares, they would be dropping slowly and moving laterally back and forth relative to each other. If I do a histogram of frame one, frame 100, frame 200, we're running video 30 frames a second. 1,800 frames a minute, so we have almost 6,000 frames. So I take every 100 frames, measure the brightness, see if it's changing. And if we built a graph over time, flares, the graph of the change looks like this, the Phoenix light, flat graph. I have footage of these objects from upwards of 20 minutes, so there is no way that it was a flare. The notion of of uh, flares and things was just uh, so absurd once seeing the pictures that you discounted it immediately. And I realized it was a manifestation that there was intelligence trying to let us know we're here. Now, let's look at this. As we had more people come forward through Francis Barwood going public and asking the question, hundreds of people came forward through that to a great body of case reports we had from Peter Davenport at the National Center, it was clear that I had to do a lot of field work if we were going to even begin to do the animation that we planned to at Village Labs at the outset. Let's try to recreate what went on to properly illustrate what the witnesses were describing. We've done motion studies of the different witness drawings the different videos that we had and built a scientific model that we then turned and moved it in as many positions as we could to find something that was either a formation of lights or lights on some object that no matter how we moved it, it fit with what was on the video and what the witnesses said. This is great to have Dr. Kitai's film, a 35 millimeter film that she had shot in addition to the videotape and all the other people's videotapes, we had this high resolution film that I could scan the orbs at 1200 dots per inch and be able to then look at the orbs as a very large object. I can look at the very fine gradations that are out on the edge. I can look frame to frame to frame for changes or that it's remaining the same. I have more data to deal with. It is my belief that very valuable information comes out of studying the color content of the entire picture and of every single light. What we're doing is looking at a composite image, an RGB image, and studying the nature of the colors that form that image. And they're not at all the same, you know, it's a real apples and oranges kind of thing. Yes. And I think this data is very valid and I don't know that it can be easily refuted. When I had the experience of seeing some lights out in the distance, the first thing I did as a, I guess, inborn skeptic myself was just try to run through every possible solution that it could be. I ran my differential diagnosis of anything it could be, and what I realized pretty quickly was nothing fit. Nothing that I could possibly run through. It definitely, it definitely wasn't flares. It wasn't airplanes. It wasn't street lights. It wasn't something on the mountain. It wasn't anything that I could think of. And it also didn't make sense that they were saying it was helicopters flying in formation because there was no sound. And even the most quiet helicopter still makes a sound. The key is here is everything we have makes noise. We don't have anything that's quiet. People will say, well, it was stealth. Well, stealth is radar evasive. It has nothing to do with what you hear. It's radar evasive, you know, not sound evasive. And the, the idea that we saw something that large and that low to the ground that was totally quiet uh, still amazes me. And in my examination of Dr. Lin's photos, uh, 
and from her uh, description of what happened, they did seem to move as a unit and they were able to stop and hover. And I'm not aware of any kind of aircraft that has a hovering capability that's silent. I don't believe it's the military testing top secret craft. If they were to do such a thing, they would do it out of the public eye, not a, above a major city. If our government or a military contractor is making something like this, they made a big mistake in letting it get loose and fly out of control right through the center of Phoenix and air traffic, and turn around, flying through military bases. If this is some sort of secret aircraft by one or more military organizations, they shouldn't be going around having it displayed in Phoenix and having it displayed in Mexico and having it displayed in other parts of the world and then making believe that it's not present. If, it, if, it's, going to, if it's going to be visualized and, and it's going to be photographed, then people should stand up and, and own it. My initial supervisor, uh, when I first arrived here at Luke, um, he was here in 97 when the incident occurred. And he remembers that two jets were scrambled uh, from one of the squadrons on Luke. Now, as far as I know, nobody ever took a shot at it, except the camera. We had an insider's report, a ground crewman, who had to help one of the pilots from one of the pairs of jets that went out out of his craft because he was so shaken up by it. One of the pilots stated that they had a visual on it, they've got gun camera film of it, they have no radar tape of it, it scared the hell out of them. Allegedly, a crewman from Luke Air Force Base called the UFO Reporting Center, Peter Davenport, about 3 a.m. that morning. Very detailed description of this mile-wide triangle craft traversing right over 7th Avenue and Indian School about that time as well. Nothing's ever been made public, to my knowledge, about instructions on how to respond to a sighting at the base. However, I know that the Firefighter's Guide to Disaster Control that is endorsed by FEMA, I believe it's chapter 13 or 14, is completely about UFO sightings and how to respond to a crash. So that kind of lends a little credence to the whole story. I try to dismiss and I try to find, like I said, I try to pick, pick apart every story that, uh, and when they came to the point of an unidentified flying object, that seemed to be the only one that I couldn't pick apart. We kept saying, well, you know, what is that? What is that? And it wasn't until after the events happened and it disappeared to the south in the darkness that we went inside. We stayed outside for a couple seconds and we went inside. And she sat on the couch, and I went to the bar, and I sit on a stool, and I took my glasses off, and we stared at each other for 5, 10, 15 minutes, who knows. And I got up, and I wanted to go back outside, and as I grabbed the door, I looked my wife right in the eye, and I said, we just saw our first UFO. And she looked at me back, and she goes, I know. It was just amazing, the credible, wonderful, detailed descriptions that witnesses shared and you knew it was from their heart. You knew that they had seen something extraordinary. I like Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is probably the one that's true. It's an extraterrestrial spacecraft. I'm learning that this is happening worldwide. What's going on here? What is this? There's amber orbs here in Belgium, amber orbs in formation in the uh, Soviet Union, triangle formation in uh, Illinois. There's a triangle formation in New Jersey. And many other countries, at least 20 other countries. Russia has been studying these phenomena for over 20 years, they admit. And, and their bottom line is that they feel they are unearthly. China has an elite group of scientists studying these phenomena. Japan built a museum. The government funded a museum so that they could promote universal peace. What a beautiful message. And just recently, Mexico, the Mexican Air Force has now come forward to say that they've had the sightings of these orbs around their aircraft, which when you look at my pictures, are identical information and characteristics. When you test the Mexico orbs, blow them up big and look at them, 
they look just like the Phoenix Lights. Dr. Richard Haynes, a very noted PhD psychologist, has been studying pilot reactions to these orbs. In fact, he's also studied what they called Foo Fighters in World War II. The identical phenomena, these rigid orbs in formation, just like what my husband and I saw outside our bedroom window in 1995. They've been around a long, long time. Throughout recorded history, uh, humans have been fascinated with the nature of light, of light beings, of anomalous lights in the sky, of, uh, which we sometimes interpret as angels, or we sometimes interpret as light beings, or we sometimes interpret as ETs, or we interpret as, as uh, literally the shining God herself or himself. Maybe these things have been occurring all of the time, and we just haven't been paying attention to them. Or we've been told, like in The Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. There's way too much information, biblically as well as just religious writing, that talks about um, visitations, angelic presences, being taken up in a ball of light, you know, Ezekiel's wheel. You could just go on, you know, Bible story after Bible story talking about what was happening. Now, if we just start discounting witnesses and witness testimony, then we get in an awful murky place where we'd be tossing out probably 90% of the Bible. There are uh, tons and tons of paintings and pictures from Europe uh, from the 16 and 1700s uh, depicting things flying through the skies. And part of that chunk of history is in acknowledging the existence throughout recorded history of phenomena like this and the roles that it have played in people's lives, and especially the, quote, native cultures who were open to receiving it. The Gila River Indian Reservation on this side of the Estrella Mountains behind South Mountain, where they report that they look up and see it all the time, and that they've been seen there for hundreds of years. That's why it's called the Estrella Mountains, Gateway to the Stars. The name itself is symbolic. Historically, anciently, to the Native Americans, this is known as the crossroads here of the gods even. The Estrella Mountains, where the Phoenix Lights were seen, mean stars. And those mountains were given that name because the Spaniards said that the Indians of the day said that's where their brothers would come and go, as if there's some kind of portal or gateway in the Estrella Mountains. And we have witness accounts, by the way, that suggest that very thing. The lights are called the, uh, the sky people. Some of the Native American tribes, everyone is very differently. Some of them go out to seek them, to seek, the, to seek their knowledge, to find out what they know. And even further, uh, other governments like the Belgian government, the French government, the Brazilian government, the Mexican government have now opened up their files on all of this and simply supporting what we're saying here. As far as our culture goes, we're way behind actually defining what I believe is a very real reality that a high, very high percentage of people have experienced. I saw the Phoenix Lights and then I saw very large orbs at a later date, three or four months later. Beautiful color, amber, and knew that there were intelligences and felt the emotion evoked in me was one of great warmth. It has been reported many, many times that the witness felt that there was something in that light, a thought form, an entity, an intelligence guidance and control that was behind it knew that they were there. They could sense it, that they could feel it. That really set me on a journey for seven years. The first four years of which I actually started looking for a logical explanation, for a source and meaning for what I had witnessed and photographed. The more I look, the more I found. Such credible data from scientists, astrophysicists, nuclear physicists, astronomers, optical physicists, and on and on that had been studying these phenomena for 20, 30 years. I had no idea. I've been involved in hundreds, 
of UFO cases in in-depth investigation. Thousands of pictures that I've looked at, about a thousand that I've really examined in detail. And when you look at the totality of the evidence, what is unique about Dr. Kitai's data, it is the most consistent, systematic, replicated um, set of information over a prolonged period of time that's been independently observed at various times by multiple individuals. This is the only case that I know of where this much data exists over this amount of time prior to and after a significant event. This is one of my favorite photographs taken by Dr. Kitai. Uh, taken camera in the same location, the lights in the same location as the Phoenix lights, but taken a month after 9-11. The film was what convinced me that the characteristics were not those of, of these halogen lights and airplane lights and all the other kind of lights that I could get a measurement on and look, you know, make the graph of the different kinds of flares and separate out the color and the brightness. My conclusion about the Phoenix Lights is that there is nothing that I can get a match to in the data table. It's not hale bop, it's not stars, it's not aircraft lights, it's certainly not car lights. For a number of reasons, it's not flares. If it's not some sort of technology that's made by us, then we have to entertain, seriously entertain the hypothesis that it is some sort of expression of highly intelligent beings. The size of the uh, craft on the Phoenix Light uh, display seemed to be far beyond anything that we have as a homegrown, uh, homegrown craft. So my suspicion is that uh, it's precisely what we think it is. It's an alien craft. Ultimately, it's going to be the people that will sort these things out rather than the government. And the worst thing that, will, that can happen to us would be as if the government said, well, it was flares, go back to sleep. For a long time since the 1940s, there's a concerted effort to try and keep this material from the public. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to hide it in plain sight. Uh, make it so that uh, credible experiences that come out, credible reports, sightings, are uh, surrounded with ridicule, uh, surrounded with uh, the debunkers who try and uh, give prosaic explanations for something which just does, defies explanation. There is a small percentage of things that cannot be explained. But even if it's only one percent that can't be explained, or if it's one one thousandth of one percent, that's enough. It only takes one. The Phoenix Lights are tremendously significant because they're another wake-up call for people who are skeptical or people who are secretly wondering what it's all about. And the Phoenix Lights were so visible, seen by so many, and so publicly acknowledged, even in the media. If you can create a structured controversy, say, I mean, let the flare story happen, knowing that a lot of people aren't gonna believe it, and some people are, but let's see how it goes. And then, let's get on the phone, and let's call up USA Today, CBS, ABC, NBC, MSNBC, and let it trickle down through the news management that we think this story should be covered. You get your people there. And it happened. It happened in a big way. It happened fast and turned a lot of heads, made worldwide news, and then it was denied. Why wouldn't all these news media people who are in a perfect position to investigate all this, why aren't they at the least bit curious? Why don't they want to know what it is? Look what happened in 52 when all those craft flew around the Capitol building and everybody went, 4,000 people saw them and looked up and went, oh my God, oh my God. Nothing happened. The word barely got out across the country. That's not true anymore. The Phoenix Lights is the, what, the first case, that, that's the first case where there was chat rooms about it. Microsoft Network forums had a weekly chat room about the Phoenix Lights. It was the Phoenix Lights website I had gone to, and the first thing I thought was just like, the color and the, the shape of the lights, it was just like, this is what I saw. That's the way that everything will go in the next wave. 
for investigating UFO cases and talking about it. It's going to be the internet as the tool. So as sightings like the Phoenix Lights have happened elsewhere in the world, people can go, hey, it's just like we saw in Phoenix. So many witnesses, thousands and millions of witnesses all over the planet are telling the media all over the planet basically the same story. Phoenix Lights had global impact because of the international news that happened about it, not dismissing it. Not only was it a very significant mass sighting, many investigators call it the largest sighting ever, lasting the longest amount of time seen by the largest number of people, grand scale. But at another level, global media, it was all over the news everywhere for a long time, months and months, and then every year it gets on the media again because there's something significant about it. When I first joined the military, I put in for Luke for the simple fact that the occurrence of 97, uh, I was hoping to maybe see something myself. When the, the orbs returned in January of 98, uh, I was on the roof of our building at Village Labs. Uh, having been uh, on alert, uh, Dr. Lynn called. We had been alerted that the orbs had been showing up uh, the nights before. So everyone, the Phoenix Lights Video Witnesses Club, if you will, were all ready with their cameras in their various positions around the valley. When I first stepped out on my balcony and saw the uh, two amber orbs to the southwest, I dropped my soda on the balcony and ran in to grab my video camera. And I put the spotter scope right on it, I zeroed in it, and it stayed right on it. And what was extraordinary is that light went off and it came on again over a 20 minute period and it did not move from that position because it stayed fixed in the scope. I have to tell you I was really uh, deeply impressed by the display that unfolded. As Jim came up to join me we really were now together to witness a grand display of several orbs that were variously in a straight line as if you could draw a ruler or lay a ruler end to end. Lights going on and off in the same positions and then ending up in a triangle as if to communicate a simple geometric based message. A lot of the times the orbs will line up in a straight line. They'll move into patterns, mostly geometric patterns. Greater frequency of the triangular shape. It was impressive, and uh, we both reacted as if this was an extraordinary event and certainly not a display of flares thanks to the military. I've been sitting out on the balcony every night since. Uh, I've got some good footage so far, and uh, it's pretty compelling. I think society is influenced, of course, by Hollywood and the perception that, you know, there's this fear element and that that's a natural response. Hollywood has really trained us to feel that aliens are scary and they're going to hurt us and you know there's really no way to know what to expect except for what we've been trained to believe. Hollywood likes the violence. All the movies and all the E.T. movies, every time E.T. and UFOs and all this is involved, 95 percent of it's violence where they're attacking us, they're killing us. So a lot of people has a mindset right here that hey those are evil people, those are evil beings, they're here to hurt me. And yet, I think that's the furthest thing from the truth there is. If I would see something in the daytime, big, huge thing coming flying over, I think I'd be a little afraid. When children especially saw this mile-long triangle craft, they were scared. Their initial reaction was fear. But as it slowly passed right over their heads, silent, gliding right over them, not only children, but adults as well, felt a connection to the phenomena, felt a calmness take over them. Nobody I talked to said, I was terrified. What they said was, I was amazed, I was astounded, um, it was incredible, I was excited. It amazes me that we got to see something that large, that low to the ground, that slow, no visible means of propulsion whatsoever, no noise whatsoever, and it was able to stay up and it did no damage. If it were ours, the amount of propulsion needed to stay up because of our gravity, 
It would have destroyed buildings, houses, it would have deafened people, it would, people would have been wrecking cars. I mean, none of that happened. It was a totally friendly visit. No one was hurt, no one was scared. They, they didn't become blind, and nothing was dropped on them. Nothing had happened to me. Nothing had happened to anyone I'd known. Nobody was harmed. What most people experienced was a, this phenomenal sense of wonder and awe and appreciation for being alive and witnessing it at that moment. Once all these things came to my mind, I just thought, wow, what a neat thing. And that actually helped open up my mind to the rest of my life with a sense of wonder. Almost universally, people who have anomalous experiences with lights or craft or things that they see never re recount it as fearful. Always recount it as filled with awe and wonder of amazement, of wanting to connect to these phenomena. Hopefully, as society matures a little bit more and becomes more comfortable about talking about these events, these beings, that that fear will diminish. And I think if the fear continues, that's their choice. They're using that then as a defense mechanism to help them be comfortable with something they can't put a label on, something they cannot explain. If you're terrified of seeing something and then you see something that you're terrified of, what are you going to do? Your own beliefs are going to color you to lead you to have a negative experience. So it's your belief structure that has prevented you from having the positive experience that's really there. When people recount an experience, it tells you more about them than it actually does about the experience. If they need to be angry, they usually vent annoyance and how dare they and that kind of thing. But over time and looking at it and comparing it with others, there is almost nothing really fearful about any of it. Imagine that you're an unearthly being. You want to communicate, you want to help. But if you appear, you show up in a, in a seminar room, or you show up at the foot of somebody's bed, or you come down in lights, what's going to happen? You're going to frighten people. So how do you, if you could put yourself in their shoes, if there is a their shoes, how do you go about um, helping without frightening? It is important that people, at the very least, have an open mind. It is important that they are also very prepared and to deal with whatever happens. I discovered in my own research that these powerful types of experiences have happened throughout history in various cultures, but they're described differently in different cultures. One of the problems that a government or a church or anyone has in explaining the extraterrestrial situation is that it requires non-physical definitions in order to explain it. Both contemporary mathematics and contemporary physics acknowledges the fact that there are more than four dimensions. Um, it's the, the most integrative of contemporary theories in physics called string theory. It requires the notion of having 10 or 11 dimensions. And we typically can have a difficult time measuring things in three dimensions, let alone four dimensions, adding time. So just adding one more dimension makes all kinds of possibilities. Time travel, interdimensional doorways and gateways and things, that the rules would hold true interdimensionally for folks everywhere. Saints, angels, avatars, ghosts, intergalactic travelers all follow the same rules of interdimensional place hopping. We coexist. I don't think it's a planet far, far, far away, you know, I don't think that at all. I think we coexist, this is dimensional, we share the same space, we just don't know it. It wasn't until the quantum physicists started saying, hey, there's lots of realities out there, that we got any kind of backing and credibility at all. My remembrance as I think back uh, in the 60s when there was a lot of interest in this topic is that there were so many reports that it was possible to debunk as frauds and, and people that, that were just uh, completely unreliable. There also were a set that were never explained. God forbid that you'd go to an astronomer or to an engineer who's gonna say, 
I'm not even going to bother because we all know for a fact there's no such thing. These people either made a mistake or they're lying. We went through that whole phase and that kind of drove the topic off the table in terms of the research community. Just because we may not have the technology yet to definitively define what these things are, it doesn't mean they're not real. We may just be looking on the AM dial for an FM frequency. As a scientist, I think anything that's not understood should be investigated. You know, that's, that's just uh, what science is all about. Follow the data and let the data speak. And if the data takes us in areas where it needs and requires us that we change our mind about what we have been taught, what we believe, then that's what we need to do. We used to think the Earth was flat. We now accept that it's round. We used to think that the uh, sun revolved around the Earth. Now we know it's the opposite way, and we've accepted that fact. We used to think that objects were really solid. Now quantum physics tells us it's mostly, quote, empty space. It's organized energy. We can even accept that, too. We have to get a different perspective on what's going on around us. And as a culture, stop denying that people see, hear, and experience things that, granted, are out of the ordinary. There's going to be a time where they're not going to be able to hide it anymore. There's too much technology today. Too many people have video cameras and digital cameras and the internet to relay it all on. It's only a matter of time. There's healing here. I'm a physician. and. I come to this whole forum, not only now with knowledge that I've seen something personally, not only knowledge that I've sought out and found, credible, credible knowledge, but also knowing there are many people that need to be healed, that need to know that they're not crazy, that it's not a mirage. I'm very relieved to, uh, to be able to talk about it with someone who, who understands uh, you know, maybe I can get some, some answers. I'm credible, and I saw what I saw, and I'm not afraid to talk about it or to share it. I think it should be shared. One of the worst things people can do is keep it bottled up inside you. I think one of the best things you can do is to open up. There's nothing wrong with that, and you'll find out you feel pretty good about it. It has all the earmarks of a kind of, uh, of an epiphany, the kind of thing that occurs like once or twice in life that absolutely changes you forever and then like a good scientist you, you want to say why did this happen or what does this really mean I want to know the truth I want to be there I want to see it I want to touch it I want to I want to ask questions I would like to have some of the alternative uh, explanations for uh, things that occur to be explored further uh, so that our kids can actually have some hard data, some hard uh, scientific empirical uh, evidence that what's happening to them has a base in reality and is real and that they're not crazy. What's very exciting at this time is that so many very distinguished and credible and educated scientists, researchers, physicians, doctors are coming forward. It so happened as when it was going on I was, became aware of it and was listening to a blow-by-blow blow description and was consulted on it afterwards. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure you were looking at a very valid phenomenon. There's no question that there is a phenomenon. And for anyone to be still questioning whether there is a phenomenon is deluding themselves. Read about it. There's certainly enough information out there if one wants to and chooses to. It is a choice. I would only tell the friends that um, that are trusted by me, and probably other people would make fun of me because unless they see it with their own eyes, some humans just don't believe things. Many people are not willing to look at something they've had no experience with, but the moment it touches them, they see something, their wife or spouse sees something, they at least start thinking about it. We're not the only ones here. In this big universe, there are a lot of other people. We just haven't met them yet. But of course we're not alone in the universe, and there's too much out there for us to just be the only uh, living beings in this universe.
What astrophysics uh, strongly implies is the probability that there is life other than us in the universe um, is uh, highly, highly probable. There are so many stars and probably other planets out there that the scientists haven't even seen yet. It just seems incredible to me with two, over 200 billion stars in our own galaxy, and there are billions if not trillions of galaxies, how could we be alone? The Hubble telescope, just in the last five to ten years, has changed the face of time and space and gravity as we know it. Our galaxy, our one Milky Way galaxy, and who knows how many trillions there might be out there, is 12 to 14 billion years old. Our solar system is a very young solar system. It's only four to six billion years old. There may actually be intelligent entities out there billions of years ahead of us. What if everyone woke up tomorrow and knew that extraterrestrials come here? For sure, positive. Then what? Maybe we would have more reflection on how we are being as a people, as a nation, as a culture, as a planet. It would help us to wake up. It would help us to see that we're not the end all be all. So I think it would be a good thing. I feel that the event woke me up. That I got out of my daily routine of getting up, going to work, coming home, cooking dinner, eating dinner, watching TV, going to bed. You know, because you got kids, you got baseball, you got all this stuff going on. Life is such a routine. This woke us up that there's something greater out there, that there's more out there, and wake up, open up, open up your heart, open up your mind, because it's real. What happens when these phenomena occur, these anomalistic phenomena occur, that people come awake, maybe for the first time in their lives, but the opportunity is there all of the time. Reality, you know, as people sometimes say, is only what I can see, hear, touch, feel, and so on. But uh, the things that we call paranormal are actually part of the same reality. We're just not tuned into it yet. Whether you believe in it or not, there's the potential that we can learn so much from what could be out there. We're an adolescent species at this point. Our consciousness is changing, our body's changing, our knowledge is changing. Wouldn't that be great if it did change? And that we all had an aha moment when we go, we're not alone in this universe, and we're not these little nations warring and feuding with each other and doing power trips with each other, that there's other planets and other universes and other intelligent beings who are looking down on us and going, Oh my God, <laughs> what are these people doing? I believe they are trying to communicate. Um, we just haven't figured out how they're trying to communicate with us. We do have powers and we need to learn to tap into those powers so that we can communicate with them, so that we can understand them, so that we can be a part of their reality and simultaneously allow them to be a part of our reality. Listening is very important and we can even calm ourselves and quiet ourselves to not only listen to each other on this planet but to listen to what the messages are that are coming from off planet. Until we do that, until we allow them into our reality, there is no communication. They can talk to us all they want to but until we let them into who we are as a body, mind and spirit, we just have a one-way communication. It's time. It's time for the communication and the education to go galactic. If there's one race of extraterrestrials visiting here, if there's just one, there's a lot. You think there would be only one race of extraterrestrials in the entire universe and us and that's it? You have to accept sooner or later the fact that we're not alone. And once you accept that fact, then you're going to have to accept also the fact that there's many, many, many alien races out there, not just one. There could be hundreds. There could be thousands. Each with their own lifestyle, their own purposes for their destiny and their own reasons for why they come to Earth and visit us. Is this possible that these lights are being very carefully and gently present? As a, as a potential guidance and warning system for us to wake up to what we're doing to our planet and ourselves before it's too late.
So I think they would be kind of concerned about what we're doing on our planet because we're polluting it, we're trashing it, and we're doing all other things to it, like doing wars so the land gets all messed up too. I believe that the condition that we're under as a global civilization, uh, it's becoming apparent that the violence we're causing to our environment, uh, to our non-sustainable, non-renewable resources is becoming obvious. The problem is it's not clear all the solutions that must be brought about in order to combat that. We have a real problem on our hands. But uh, we caused it so we can turn it around if we have the will to do so. We should probably explore more about space and focus our technologies and other ways besides war. And when we gain the capability to discover another civilization, I would hope we would have the good sense just to observe and see what's going on. And I would hope that our visitors are probably doing just that. They come from all over the universe to come and check out this planet of these advanced beings that have free will, tremendous spiritual potential, intellectual capacity, evolving DNA happening at rapid levels, and they're rushing headlong to destruction. We're going to have to wake up. We're going to have to become knowledgeable. We're going to have to uh, develop new science because we still don't know all the answers to the questions, who are we, how do we get here, where are we going, and our relationship to the cosmos. We're having trouble with our relationship with each other. We still use violence to settle conflict. And if we're to have a sustainable civilization, those behaviors must go away. And they're not going to go away until we change and find peace within ourselves. If we destroy this planet, the consequences do not just reside with us. The consequences are very, very galactic. So they're very concerned that humanity does evolve. Those that are really awake to it and realize that we are not alone, also realize that we are spiritual beings with so much positive potential, so much positive potential to do good and to help make this world a better world. I think we're spiritual beings riding around in a physical body. And for a long time, we've had to pay a lot of attention to just getting through the physical. And I think the spiritual has suffered, but we are in a spiritual renaissance right now. And I think the Phoenix Lights are part of that. There are very few things that are bigger and more important to every human being on the planet than the topic of this documentary of the implications of, the, of what the Phoenix Lights represents. It was clearly no accident that this demonstration and parade, this extraordinary single category, single class event of the Phoenix Lights occurred. Multiple purposes, multiple dimensions, multiple impact potential. And I think uh, we're only beginning to see the tip of the iceberg of the effect of what took place back in March 13th of 1997 here. Years later, it still gives me goosebumps. So I'm into it, I, I can't help it. It's a part of my life. It's, it's a good part of my life, it's a good thing. The anomalous experience, whether it's seeing the Phoenix lights, uh, believing you've been contacted, having conversations with other dimensions, it doesn't really much matter. What matters is what you make of it and what you do with it. We're all here together for a reason, and we're all here together for a purpose. And uh, what could the highest, greatest purpose of our being here be? And that would be to, to love one another, to be kind to one another, to be compassionate, to, um, to share our joy with each other, and to listen, to listen to each other. If we had the opportunity to listen to this information, and therefore help our children and help the world grow before it's too late, and we didn't take the opportunity, it will come back to us. It's important that we look at our civilization, our place in history, use our tools of science for greater understanding, to promote the greater good, and that's what it's all about. I think we are in a pinnacle point of our civilization 
and I think it makes a difference which direction we go next. Hopefully, we'll have contact one day. If enough people are really open and realize that there is nothing to fear. I look forward to that. It was all too symmetrical. You can't control flares that way. There's just no way they were flares. It was so technologically advanced that uh, it was a thrilling feeling to see it. The lights were really brilliant, uh, and it was just fascinating. It, I mean, it was, it was enormous. It just felt otherworldly. You know, you're, in your gut, you could just tell it was otherworldly. It has never been identified to this date. And I suspect that uh, unless uh, uh, the Defense Department proves us otherwise that it was probably uh, some form of an alien spacecraft. If a strange being came to my door, would I be scared? Would I be... Uh, frightened uh, would I welcome it? I don't know. It depends on how ugly it is. If they would come to my door, I would say, well, come on in. Let's talk. Let me find out more about you. <laughs> that would be great. Oh, my. <laughs> Such fun. <laughs>